I'll speak today on the topic of the invisible impersonalism within us. So I will share a PowerPoint and I'll speak based on that. And we can have uh, question answers at the end. So what do we mean by this invisible impersonalism? Broadly, now recently I was a part of an interfaith forum. And in this interfaith forum, basically we were discussing about how in different religious or spiritual groups, if somebody goes off track, that means so that generally on a spiritual path, people can go off track in two ways. Generally, on, there, are, there are beliefs and there are practices. So following traditional beliefs is called orthodoxy. Doxy is the of beliefs. And practices is called as orthopraxy. And the opposite of orthodox is heterodox. So if somebody goes off and starts propagating some different philosophy, from what has been practiced before, what has been taught before, or somebody starts having, starts practicing something which is different from what has been practiced before. So how do, how do we deal with that? I mean, the Christian word for this is heresy. Her heresy means a it's a belief or a practice that is deviant, that is contradictory, not just deviant, different from, but contradictory to what are the traditional teachings. And this is often a subject, this is subject of concern for almost every traditional, every group that is grounded in tradition. So it's so different, uh, different groups expressed what they did. And that was a well-known impersonalist group on the forum. And they described the recent experience of someone XYZ who had taught, started teaching something. And it struck me and they had a whole plan that they would have different levels of say leaders going and meeting that person personally and trying to understand what made him do this and then gradually try to come to a, a conciliatory understanding. So it struck me that while their philosophy was impersonalist, they were very personal in their dealings with people. They didn't simply say that, oh, you, 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 you have deviated, you are a deviant, we condemn you. No, they were very personal in their approach to understand that person and then try to address their underlying concerns. So then that, made me, that struck me, that made me get the realization that actually our philosophy may be personal, but we may actually treat people impersonally. So when I'm talking about the invisible impersonalist within us, I'm not talking so much imper of impersonalism as an ideology, wherein we believe the impersonal absolute truth. I'll explain what that means. But I'll be talking more about impersonalism as a mentality where we deal with people in an impersonal manner. So let's look at this. I'll be talking three broad topics. The impersonalism that we consciously refute. Hmm? Often we stress that this as ideology, impersonalism is wrong. But then there is a kind of impersonalism that we subconsciously reinforce. Uh, and what we'll discuss, that is the impersonal behavior that we sometimes give into it. And then lastly, we'll discuss how bhakti is especially in dealings with people, it shouldn't be just a personal dealing, but it's a radical personalism. I'll explain what radical personalism means. So now the impersonalism we consciously refute. We may, we may argue with someone that the ultimate reality is personal, not impersonal. That Krishna is a person and Brahma Jyoti is impersonal. Well, that is true. But this understanding that the ultimate reality is personal, not impersonal, is not exactly correct. So 
sometimes we make a mistake because the ultimate reality is personal and impersonal it's both so the misconception is actually not whether the reality is personal or ultimate reality that is personal or impersonal but what is the grounding or the original ultimate reality so the conflict is does the impersonal absolute come from the personal absolute or does the personal absolute come from the impersonal so the, imp the, the impersonal is the advaita vadis hold that krishna the person comes from the brahman and is a temporary manifestation of the brahman whereas the vaishnavas the personalists they hold that the impersonal brahman comes from krishna now generally for the scriptural matters like this what is the authority for resolving the authority is spiritual for spiritual matters is spiritual texts and that is the shastra so the shastra itself is quite clear about this the gita in 14 uh, 27 says brahmano hi pratishtaham amrutasya vyasya cha shashvatasya cha dharmasya sukhasya ikantikasya cha so brahmano hi pratishtaham krishna says the pratishtha the foundation of brahman is aham me so he is saying that brahman is grounded in founded in me it's like when we lay a pratishtha means foundation so when we uh, do the lay the foundation stone for a building or a house then the foundation lies and then from the about the foundation everything else is built so krishna is the foundational reality and brahman the all pervading absolute comes from the personal absolute that is bhagwan sri krishna so this is philosophy now this is not something which is new but I, this is the impersonalism that we may often refute quite consciously and we we talk about why it is wrong and this is not the topic we are going to go to but impersonalism as i said it can be an ideology and it can be a mentality so ideology is the belief system that we have and mentality i am using it to refer to the behavioral pattern that we have how do we behave with people and sometimes despite our impersonal philosophy the impersonalism that we unconsciously reinforce that means we treat the other person mechanically not reciprocally mechanically means what does a machine do machine just runs according to a program and reciprocally means we understand who that person is where that person is coming from and then we reciprocate with that person now all of us we find impersonalism annoying at the very least let's consider we we may be our phone is not working and we call their helpline and and the helpline if it's a machine voice that picks up now even if the machine voice is pretending to be human it just giving pre programmed answers and if the answers are not addressing our concerns soon we get irritated so the what does the voice do the voice just follows the program and we want we want actually to connect with a person so although ai is improving artificial intelligence is, is improving constantly you know artificial intelligence is a whole big subject can machines be conscious now machines can do an incredible amount of things which we in the past thought would have been impossible but no matter how much artificial intelligence advances what it will be able to do is it can do anything that we can describe in step by step analytical terms and a machine can't do anything more than what we describe in step by step analytical terms so that's the that's the grounding limitation of ai because if you can describe something in step by step analytical terms we can write a code for it and this is where uh, a machine no uh, a machine ai can't have a proper conversation now now when we can have a functional conversation okay uh, which is the which is the way where which way do i turn to go here which way do i go for a shop find a shopping mall the functional conversations 
but a proper conversation between two people where people are opening their heart and connecting now, it doesn't follow a pre-programmed pattern there is no specific end toward which it is going toward which it is going we will plan to discuss on a particular topic but then as the discussion emerges as the top as the topics emerge we may need to appropriately adapt and that is what a machine can't do and that's why if you take siri or cortana or google voice or google okay google and then you start trying to have a conversation with them i'm feeling depressed okay and you give okay this is a list of techniques for dealing with depression you can't go much further than that so in the past some of the some companies when they thought ai was improving they started using machines to replace operators and the machines would try to pretend to be humans but when the client, when the customers picked it up the blowback for that was so severe they stopped doing that as initially we all might get machines okay call one for this two for this three for this four for this but eventually they, they try to provide human operators so impersonal behavior is where somebody is simply going according to a program and is not really personally concerned about what we are doing that we soon find annoying so what might happen is that i'm talking about how we as despite being the followers of a personalist philosophy we might behave in an impersonal way how might this happen broadly in three ways we might have impersonal view of people in we reduce conscious beings to abstract philosophical categories we treat people as targets for downloading a pre-processed preaching program and then we dismiss sensitivity as sentimentality let me explain what i mean by these three things so let's look at the first thing reduce conscious beings to abstract philosophical categories so here you see this diagram actually raman krishna prabhu has been helping me in making illustrations and he along with a team now rohan prabhu and shilpi mata ji they also helping so they help make this diagram for me so if you look at her here i'm grateful to them for their creative assistance we are using this in geeta daily and in future we might also use this as a geeta illustrated uh, kind of presentation so here if you look at a person a person has many different aspects to them their their personality their identity so there is cultural side the social side this professional side the intellectual side national side the philosophical side so people are multidimensional people are complex beings but when we start studying philosophy we just put a philosophical label on them this person is a atheist this person is a materialist this person is a uh, impersonalist and based on what label we have put on that person what category we have placed that person in we start becoming quite dismissive if their category is unfavorable Uh, say for example mm. some people might say that oh this person is a meat eater this person is a meat eater or worse still a cow flesh eater okay. and therefore you know if a person is a cow flesh eater what intelligence can that person have that person is a dumb person well okay yes from that particular behavioral perspective uh if we can say that that's a cultural perspective okay that person might be doing something which is objectionable but they are not defined by that activity it is not that 24 hours a day they are doing nothing but eating cow flesh that's not their full time activity that okay that's a part of their diet and there could be many reasons why they do it's not that because they hate cows it is because maybe that was the culture they grew up in but then at a social level that person might be very helpful might be very very gentle might be having a humanitarian com humanitarian compassion for other human beings at a per that person at a professional level might be very competent in their work yet at the intellectual level in terms of contemporary issues they might be intelligent so we can't reduce people to one behavioral label or reduce people to one philosophical label so often this question comes up 
can atheists be good people sometimes we consider atheism to be like a philosophical category and we put that label on this person is atheist so are all atheists bad people no atheists can also be good people so atheism is a philosophical a label, philosophical ident uh, orientation identifier but atheists themselves maybe they why they became atheists what was their culture before becoming atheists what is their overall nature that will determine their behavior so if we see in the bhagavad gita krishna wherever whether there is the mahabharat or the ramayana wherever there is a war that is fought the war is never fought against wrong believers the war is fought against wrong doers so duryodhana or ravana they were not condemned because of what they were believing there was diversity in belief in fact uh, if we see there were characters on the mahabharat war on the opposite side on the kaurava side who were actually great devotees bhishma was a great devotee drona was a brahmana who was also a, a strict worshipper of vishnu then there were there were older members of the kuru dynasty who had continued on living bhagadatta and others who were also vaishnavas but they were they were wrong doers and the the war was against wrong doers so wrong if people can have different beliefs and some beliefs can be right some beliefs beliefs can be wrong but you don't reduce people to their beliefs to their philosophical orientations it's one part of them but to reduce a person to their philosophical identity is actually to treat people impersonally that means that we consider that person okay even if we consider 100 people who have who identify themselves as impersonalists but they have their own individuality and they have they may have their own individual visions about nation about culture about society and we can't just take that one one aspect of their behavior and condemn them for that so this is a reductionistic vision is characteristic of the mode of ignorance in the as described in the bhagavad gita and that is perception or knowledge in the mode of ignorance yattu krutsnavade kasmin karye saktam haitukam atatvarthavad alpam cha tad tamasam udaharutam yattu krutsnavad ekasmin when everything is reduced to one when one thing is made into everything and atatvarthavat one doesn't see the complete picture alpam cha one sees only a small part of it tad tamasam udaharutam and shri prabhupad when he came to america he lived in uh, first uh, after he came new to new york he was staying in the mishra yoga studio and this mishra he happened to be a impersonalist and prabhupad and he would often have vigorous arguments but still prabhupad would cook for him prabhupad would serve prasad to him and i think many years later he met prabhupad and prabhupad and he were talking so warmly and then prabhupad later on told giriraj maharaj and giriraj maharaj told me in one of our conversations that philosophically you know we would fight with each other but culturally we were friends philosophically we would fight argue with each other but culturally we were friends that means prabhupada did not reduce him oh, you are impersonalist you have to be condemned he saw okay as a culture he was also as a, a cultured human being he was also a more or less of not of the same age as prabhupada but somewhat of that near that age and he was also a teacher and he was also teaching along with impersonalism he was teaching 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 sort of vedic values so prabhupada treated him as a friend so this is important that we don't label and reduce people to those labels and this this is how if we do this we start treating people impersonally so what happens is even when we start speaking or preaching i am use the word preaching deliberately because preaching has a preachy holier than thou self righteous kind of sense but even when we are preaching impersonalism we might treat it impersonal speak impersonally how is that because even among people who are impersonalists 
there are very few who are hardcore impersonalists hardcore impersonalist means those people have made their impersonalism their defining identity and they are basically uh, our, their life's mission is to refute all other forms of philosophy and impose impersonalism on everyone there are very very few people who are like that and most people are under impersonal influence that means they might have just started exploring spirituality and they found someone who or they read some books and those books said that the ultimate reality is is a light and we want to merge into it and they thought, yeah okay that might be the ultimate reality so so they read it somewhere they heard it somewhere they got it um they it was just passed on to them so such people who are under impersonal influence they may even come to a krishna temple and they will sincerely worship krishna and for them the philosophical ideological part okay i am thinking the, the the ultimate reality is impersonal but this is krishna what is it actually well they may not even think much about these things see for most people the philosophy is not primarily what gets them to come to krishna it is often the culture that is that they find in a particular center the way people deal with them their own emotional or cultural needs that are there all there are many factors which get people to come to a spiritual path so philosophy is one part of it important part but still just one part so when we reduce people to their philosophical labels then it becomes a problem so somebody so for many people their impersonalism may not their they may have a impersonal belief system but their impersonal philosophical orientation or belief system that may not obstruct them from coming to krishna as much as our condemning them for their impersonalism because they may say oh impers so many teachers this teacher and that teacher are talking about impersonalism are you saying they all wrong and that might that might actually obstruct them much more now they might have gone to some they might have chanted some om mantra or done something and they might have got some experience by that and that experience is what is taking them forward now that experience might just be some sattvic experience might be just some preliminary experience of spiritual reality and devotional experiences can be far richer and deeper and sweeter but instead of giving them the experience of krishna we start combating their philosophy and that simply alienates them because they have some experience better than the normal experience so imagine this is a normal day to day materialistic experience and this is the experience of some peace which might come because of some experience of something spiritual even if it's impersonal now this is a bhakti experience now we start criticizing that impersonalism is wrong impersonalists are wrong now what has happened is that is their experience that has made them explore life spiritual domain and if we try to critique their experience then what happens they see it as this is what has worked for me and how dare you say it's wrong so rather than criticizing people for their impersonalism we try to give them an experience of krishna and if we give them that experience then they will naturally move forward they will come up if somebody is in cold and they have just found one thin tattered sheet which is protecting them from the cold well it's not really protecting them very well from the cold but it is giving them some protection and if we tell them you know this this is a torn thin sheet what do you use just throw it away no this is protecting me from cold now our intention might be i'll give you a nice thick soft comforter but they have not experienced that comforter they have only experienced whatever relief comes from that thin sheet so if we try to pull away that sheet from them they may fight with it for their life and then just go away from us so instead of trying to pull away that sheet we need to focus on putting the comforter around them and once we put the comforter around them hey this is so cozy this is so this is so pleasant and do i really need that sheet no i don't then put it aside so putting the comforter around them is like giving them the experience of krishna and trying to pull out the earlier tattered sheet from them that is like trying to counter their existing philosophical ideas so more important than more important than countering wrong philosophy 
is giving people the right experience. And once they get the right experience, they will gradually come toward the right philosophy. So now some people might dismiss. So this is, I made a second point that we might just treat people as targets for downloading a program onto them. As soon as we see somebody the impersonalist, tuck, 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 you know, just this is wrong, this is wrong, this is the word, this is the logic, this is the word, this is the logic. We might just parrot certain arguments to them. Well, does that person really need that at that time? That's what we need to consider. What does this person need to rise from where they are to come one step toward Krishna? That is treating people personally. But treating people impersonally means that as soon as we meet a person, we start downloading a program on them. No, that won't work. And then when we talk about such time, place, circumstance, some people might call it just sentiment. Oh, you are just being sentimental. So actually, there's a difference between sensitivity and sentimentality. What is the difference? So sensitivity is to be aware where people are hurting and then speak accordingly to heal their wounds, speak or act accordingly. So suppose somebody has been wounded, maybe she had one time for almost one and a half years, I was continuously sick, maybe 15, 17 years ago. And despite doing so many tests, the doctors couldn't diagnose also what was wrong with me. And they had done so many blood tests that my whole practically, mm, both my arms, all the places where you take, take uh, blood samples, they were already having some small holes in them. So then when the nurse wanted to take my blood sample, that nurse actually waited and searched for almost five, six minutes to find a spot from where they could take the blood without causing too much pain. But that nurse didn't have to do that. She said, you know, it's your problem that you have so many skin piercings. And my job is to take a blood, take the blood. But no, there was just some concern. So sensitivity means that if people are hurting, we need to acknowledge their hurt and then speak or act in a way that helps them heal their wounds. That's sensitivity. So we have to be aware of people's hurts. Sentimentality would mean that, say somebody doesn't, say, oh, you got so many wounds, let's avoid taking the blood sample. No, that or let's not, or let's avoid giving you a dose. No, if the dose is required, it has to be given. So sentimentality means we just don't do the right thing because we feel it will cause the pain to them. No, we sometimes have to speak the right thing. But just because we are speaking the right thing doesn't give us the right to, to not, even, not even concern consider whether our what the impact of our words is going to be on them. That when people often have some impersonal orientation, that is because they might be attracted by some impersonal teacher. And when it comes to people, we have to understand that people have emotions invested in, in their particular venerable figures. And if we if we criticize or dismiss those venerable figures, then that, uh, that not only would we be disrespectful, but we would alienate them. So we need to be sensitive. We don't want to be sentimental. Now, what is the difference between the two? One is not care, not sentimental is not giving the injection at all, not taking the blood at all. But sensitive is, okay, taking it in a way that causes the least pain. So here there is a diagram, a pendulum to illustrate this point. That one extreme is, on the right side you see they're sentimental. They're driven only by our sentiments. The other extreme is to be heartless, to have no sentiments at all. Just, uh, just like a heartless machine, a heartless program. Just do what is to be done. But the other is, in between is to be clear-headed. This is, we are sensitive. A sensitive means, I'm using the word clear-headed over here because that means we are not driven only by sentiments. We are clear headed is actually a combination of sensitive and sensible. We, we want to do that the thing which is sensible, but we are also aware of the emotional side of it and then we act accordingly. So this is what dealing with people uh, personally would imply. Now moving forward, and this is radical personalism. Our philosophy is a philosophy of radical personalism. Now, what do we mean by radical personalism? That we look at a person's situation and then 
we speak accordingly so and this might this this image is often about arjuna bewildered um, and the bhagavad gita being spoken to him but there was another situation also when arjuna was bewildered was not just bewildered but he was devastated so we can just to get a sense now to enter into that situation let's try to visualize as uh, the situation a bit more we as devotees you know we when we hear about krishna leela it is not just something to be heard it is something actually it is it is certainly not just something to be for our entertainment it is meant to be entered into so one way we could enter into krishna leela is to imagine if we are one of the witnesses one of the minor participants in the krishna leela so so and imagine now that uh, this is the 13th day of the kurukshetra war and say you are one of the guards who is in the tent the main battle tent where the warriors meet and you see all the pandavas except for arjuna is sitting they are sitting the other cow pandava warriors are there and all their faces are sunk they are all looking down and arjuna and krishna come in and arjuna is looking disturbed oh, what's going on here arjuna looks around at the guards and nobody meets their meets his eyes arjuna is now looking worried why is he worried because he is worried because nobody is uh, talking with him there is no celebratory music of the victory of that day and he comes in and he looks around and he sees all the warriors is his eyes immediately go to the seat of his dear son abhimanyu and that seat is empty arjuna's heart stops beating and he goes to yudhishthir who is sitting on the improvised throne he says oh brother oh king why is everybody so morose what is wrong yudhishthir can't even look at him yudhishthir looks up and oh brother oh arjuna i have a heart breaking news for you abhimanyu was killed on the battle today arjuna can't believe it arjuna is shattered this collapses on the ground this is how did this happen where was i what kind of father am i that i couldn't be there for my son and as he is lamenting yudhishthir gets up from his throne comes near him and starts speaking how jayadrath blocked all of them and then abhimanyu was trapped alone in the chakravyu and he fought heroically he defeated all the kaurava warriors not one kaurava warrior could counter him but unfortunately brutally six of them attacked him together and arjuna cries out in pain when he hears the final account of how abhimanyu has been killed and then arjuna's agony gives way to anger and he lashes out you know we what would arjuna do in such a time we may think arjuna has heard the philosophy of the bhagavad gita will he be astita pragya will he be unmoved by any kind of emotions now arjuna is completely over him arjuna turns around and lashes out verbally at his brother he says are all your weapons just ornaments could any of you protect my brother what is the use of your weapon expertise then he turns to krishna and he says krishna at least you must have known what was happening why didn't you tell me and now here arjuna is criticizing krishna he is angry with krishna 
can, can, can anyone be angry with God? Well, actually God is so compassionate that he can absorb anything that we send toward him. He can absorb even our anger. Without taking offense, Krishna walks up to Arjuna. Now what does, what does Arjuna, what does Krishna do? Krishna does not download a philosophical program. Krishna doesn't say that you are not the body, you are the soul. Abhimanyu is not the body, he is the soul. Don't be attached. No. Krishna adopts a very human approach. Krishna goes and puts a shoulder around Arjuna. And then Krishna speaks, Oh Arjuna, in this world, adversity befalls everyone sometime or the other. The character of a person is seen in how they respond to adversity. Those who are weak, those who lack virtue, they act in ways that increase the pain for themselves and for others. Those who are strong, those who are virtuous, act in ways that decreases their pain and decreases the pain of others. Arjuna, look around, look at your brothers. They loved Abhimanyu just as you did. They are as distraught and as devastated as you are. And your words are further wounds on their wounded heart. Oh, Arjuna, don't speak in a way that increases their pain. And Arjuna, Krishna pulls Arjuna into an embrace. So when Arjuna is in this distress, what does Krishna do? Krishna doesn't minimize his pain. Krishna doesn't trivialize his pain. Krishna doesn't use that as an opportunity to launch a philosophy, launch into a philosophical discourse. Krishna connects with Arjuna at a human level and sees how at a human level uh, I can help address his pain. So this is a personal approach. Personal approach means we think what is this person's situation and how can I help them in this situation. So now here there's an exercise. Mm -hmm. We can take a few minutes to do this exercise. So basically what does radical personalism mean? Treat each person personally according to their particular time, place, circumstance. So here there's a small exercise as I mentioned. Now, what is this exercise? Now think of any situation, the situation wherein you feel a person will be in the greatest pain. You think of what, what do you feel is the greatest pain that anyone may have to go through. And then think what in our philosophy can you speak to help them in their moment of pain. So what would we speak at that time? So you can take two, three minutes and do this exercise. And maybe we, some of you can speak for if you like, or at least think about this. So think of, in, based on your experience, your nature, what would you think would be the greatest pain that anyone could go through? And if that person is going through that pain, what could you speak at that time? So you have about three minutes for this. You can do this and then we can continue.
now we won't have the time to take your feedback of all of you but does any one of you would like to think of this and share some would like to share anything the world is a place of uh, you know there can be so much pain that can come in so many different ways if somebody has say lost a loved one somebody has lost a child somebody's maybe close relationship is breaking down there's so many ways different ways in which distress can come and at that time what do we speak to them yes priti mata ji Okay, I have to unmute you one minute. Yeah. Hare Krishna, Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Yeah. So, if somebody is going through a really hard time, then I would just say, "How can I be there for you? What can I do to help you?" And just kind of ask them what their needs are, um, and maybe bring them some prasad. Um, just try to be there for them even if they cry or um you know are in a lot of pain just try to be there to support them yes and that's a thank you that's what actually we need to do we need to be with people at a human level just be there to support them so what part now this we could say this is just a i mean it's it's an important thing it's a vital thing but what part of our philosophy are we say applying at that time or do you feel this no this is not a time to apply philosophy at all this is a time just to be with them at a human level is there any part of the philosophy that we could apply at that time yeah it's a tough question and and there's no easy answer for it uh and even i have made yeah you want to say something please um yeah. hari krishna prabhu um yes, then with then there with um i think yeah, this is a separate um uh, thread actually um i think like the the key is um to understand the the context of the person too right so is your devotee or non devotee because obviously you want to be personal but with devotees you can also add the krishna element which you may not add with um say a non devotee your like office friend so yeah. i think like this this when you're speaking as a speaker you need to understand your audience i think in this situation also you need to understand who that person is so you can kind of customize your messaging around that uh, exactly yes very true thank you now one of the things that uh, uh, that makes pain worse is to feel that we are alone in our pain that that actually i have to uh, i have to deal with all this alone so just having somebody to be shared be there to share the pain that itself is a big help and our philosophy has many different aspects the part about the karma may not be appropriate at all at that time so there is a time to speak about karma but it will just come off as heartless at that time it could come off as blaming the victim and that is there's a few things as alienating as that that could come off as as very very damaging but one part of our philosophy which we don't often emphasize is that you know every living being is unconditionally loved that krishna is there in the hearts of everyone and no matter what wrongs they have done or more no matter what wrongs have happened to them krishna is still with them now whether we speak this and how we speak this can vary from person to person and especially when a person is hurting and blaming god if they are blaming god then to say that god loves them would be very difficult for them to digest but rather than telling them that god loves you you know, we can give them the experience some experience of god's love through our our loving attentive understanding a kind behavior toward them 
so the key truth that we need to convey to to a hurting world is that greater than the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal it is greater than the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal now how that power is to be accessed by them how we can play a role in making that accessible to them all that are specifics but our focus is on helping people and philosophy may be one part of the of the of the things that we offer which may help them but the focus should be not just on downloading the philosophy but on helping in whatever way is appropriate so this is treating people personally i'll conclude with this one visual that sometimes the activity we might be doing might be compassionate but our mentality might not be so here we see four things so activity is compassionate that means what so somebody is giving food to a hungry person that's a compassionate activity but if that person while while they are giving food to a hungry person hungry child they are considering you know they, they have a camera near them hey take this photo take this photo and you tell that child smile smile brightly and we are concerned not so much about giving that food to that child but concerned of uh, treating it more as a photo op where you know i should come off as looking charitable for the world well sometimes some people might have to do that because at one level to raise funds or whatever but if that is the primary motive at the where the per, there's no concern for the person that person the charitable activity is there but the mentality is not charitable it is it is not compassionate it is calculative it is self aggrandizing so of course the last the worst category is where we we have neither the mentality to help others nor do we, are we doing an activity to help others so on the other hand if somebody is doing an activity to help others but their mentality is not very helping like somebody is giving charity and treating it as a photo op and if it is they are very transparent if if it can be very it's very evident it's blatant then we will feel alienated by that but sometimes it may happen we might not be giving charity of food we might be doing say we could say call it a gyan adan not annadan but gyan adan we are giving philosophy but is when we are giving philosophy is our purpose to actually help the other person or to make ourselves feel good say i spoke this philosophy and i spoke this so well and i countered the misconception well that, that might not be the that person is so materially attached and i cut off their attachments well is that the time to is that the time to do that so it can be alienating if our activity is compassionate but there's no mentality properly within it and conversely if there is the activity that is uncompassionate even if we have a mentality that is compassionate so that won't help that means i have compassion in my heart but i don't express it in any way then also it won't help so real intelligence is that there is a combination this is actually this is intelligent and this will be beneficial this will be transformational that the person we help them actually by um, by giving them what they need in a way that is beneficial for them so this is what we need to go towards in our life that we offer them in a philosophy and our conduct in a way that is beneficial so by that we can actually transform people's hearts and not just transform people's heart help them grow through whatever situations they are facing so i'll summarize what i spoke today that we spoke i spoke on the topic of the invisible impersonalism inside us so what is that impersonal in, in, invisible impersonalism it is not the ideology we may very strongly say that actually krishna is a person the ultimate reality is a person not impersonal but we might have the mentality of impersonalism in terms of our behavior so the impersonal ideology is that that although reality is both personal and impersonal to claim that the personal comes from the impersonal that is impersonalism as the bhagavad gita states that the impersonal brahman rests on and comes from the personal bhagwan 
and impersonal behavior can happen because we may reduce people to philosophical categories. So people are multidimensional, complex beings. And Prabhupada said that with about uh, about Mish, about Mishra, the yoga teacher, that philosophically we were we would fight with each other, but culturally we were friends. So don't reduce people to their philosophical categorization, and don't treat people as simply targets for downloading a preaching program on them, uh, because. Nobody likes to be treated impersonally. Like if, if some helpline pretends that there's a person, but it's actually just a uh, mechanized voice, we'll get annoyed soon. So because they're not, they're treating us mechanically, not reciprocally based on specifically what we are saying. And then we might also treat people impersonally because we may just focus on, dis we may just treat all sensitivity as sentimentality. So we discuss the pendulum. That sensitivity means we are aware of people's pain and we try to do what it takes to minimize their pain. But if you are sentimental, a, a nurse may not want to take a blood sample only because oh, it will cause you pain. And a hard-hearted person will just put in the needle even if there is already some existing wound and it causes too much pain. So we need to be balanced. Sens sens uh, sensible and sensitive, that's how we should be. And then lastly, I talk about radical personalism. Although Arjuna had spoke, Arjuna, Krishna had spoken the philosophy of the Bhagavad Gita to Arjuna before the Kurukshetra war, when Arjuna actually faced the human laws, Krishna did not take that as a launching pad for going into philosophy when, I, when Abhimanyu was killed. And then we talked about that we did that exercise, which we can, each of us, develop further. When people, somebody we know, or when somebody in the situation of what we feel would be the greatest pain, how would we deal with that? And for that, we need to be empathic. And often the, what people need is not so much a philosophical, uh, a philosophical discourse at that time. They need the experience of being cared for, being loved, being valued, being understood. And the what what is distinctive about our philosophy is that people are not alone in that suffering that they are unconditionally loved by krishna in the sense that krishna is always with them in their hearts and greater than the world's power to hurt is krishna's power to heal so we offer that healing potential we give them some experience of that healing potency in whatever way is appropriate so both our activity and our mentality needs to be compassionate if it's neither, it's, it's harmful, it's only one of them, then it can come off as a photo op if it's only the activity without the mentality. If it's only the mentality without the activity, people will not even come to know what we're thinking. And they may think we are uncaring. Both will alienate. But when both come together, then that is what is truly transformational. That is what truly beneficial. That is what will be. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. So are there any comments or questions? Priti Madhavi, do you have a question? Hare Krishna Prabhu, uh, Shri Kadadar Das here. Hare Krishna Shri Kadadar Prabhu, how are you doing? I'm good, so nice to see you Prabhu. How are you doing? Yes, oh, thanks. Krishna Masi, I'm fine. Yes, true. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, really nice class Prabhu. Um, I really liked um, your, your point on the personal philosophy and impersonal dealings. I think that's I mean, you know, that's really something which, you know, as a as an organization and as, as as a group of people, I think we we are facing. Uh, I don't know if it's a challenge we can call it, but it's a situation I think we we have to fix. Um, because on the other hand, you see impersonal organizations, but they have personal dealings, right? And they are really flourishing. And and I think this is a really important point because. You know, we see like a lot of like impersonal organization, like, you know, it could be doing like all the charity we work or other stuff. And, you know, the people really like it, like them. And somehow, you know, it's called as organization can have a negative connotation because I think, and that is also part reason is also because we do believe in personal philosophy, but we do in person dealings. And I think the example you gave about Prabhupada and uh, Dr. Mishra, I think that kind of amplifies the whole situation that we we should fight philosophically, but we should deal culturally. I think that is something which I think we all miss. 
and I think I really like like how you kind of highlighted that and amplified that that aspect by giving Prabhupada's example. So that was really nice. Thank you, Prabhupada. Thank you. Yeah. We sometimes, uh, in the name of philosophical being uncompromising, we just somehow end up being insensitive. So that's, that's unfortunate. And yeah, we don't need to learn about it more. Thank you for that comment, Shri Radha. So, yeah, so I've allowed you to unmute yourself now. If any of you wants to, okay, Brinda Mataji, yeah. Krishna Prabhuji, Thank you so much for a wonderful class. I really liked many of the points, Prabhuji. Uh, it actually is making me think about a lot of things. Because what is happening is like, uh, as uh, mentioned by Prabhupada, uh, we should not take association of Mayavadis or impersonalities given by him. And also there is a, the, like in the 10 offenses of chanting of the holy name, we hear that we should not preach someone who doesn't have faith in the holy name or uh, the cause, uh, like as in the atheists. So how, I mean, I'm confused now, like how then I can approach and then I can, uh, like, okay. I, I don't know if I'm able to Okay, let me, repeat, let me repeat the question and then we can discuss it. So okay. the question is that at one level, we are told we shouldn't instruct faithless people in the glories of the holy name. Also, we are said that we shouldn't say associate with impersonalists. So how should we deal with people when they are going through difficulties? If they, how, so yeah, so that's the two, three different things. First is that, as I said, just because somebody uh, is joined some organization, which is impersonalist, that doesn't really make them an impersonalist. They're just, most people, as I said, are under impersonalist influence. And unless they are like vehemently criticizing personalism in the sense of minimizing Krishna's form and ridiculing those who are worshiping Krishna in a personal form, we could say they are not in any way, they're not toxic impersonalists. They're just uh, benign, not exactly benign, but it's, it's not very serious. It's not likely to be seriously damaging for us. So that's the first thing. And as far as not instructing faithless people in the glories of the holy name, the idea of that is, the underlying theme of that verse is that, so faith often requires taking a leap forward. There is some things which say, if I am here, and I'm, I'm told to accept something. Say, for example, accept the existence of God. And then we can make a rational case for the existence of God. At the same time, somebody else might make a rational case for the non-existence of God. Now we could say, no, but my case is stronger. It may be true. But you, we can make a rational case for many spiritual truths. But we cannot give a irrefutable rational proof for spiritual truths. So there is a, we can making a case and like delivering a decisive irrefutable proof that that will never happen. The spiritual domain is achintya. And in that, it's in, that means it cannot be pursued only by logic. Tarko apratishta shuta yoga So what that means is reason or rationality takes us some distance along the journey. So imagine this is one mountain peak. This is another mountain peak. Hmm? And then for people to cross over that, uh, say this is the, they believe in the world of facts. Uh, facts, this is the material world. And then there's the world of spirituality, which is not exactly the factual in the same material sense. We can't, it's not, they believe in empirical things. The spiritual world is not exactly empirical. So now we can make a rational case for it. And that's like building a bridge. So that bridge can take us from this mountain but that bridge won't actually entirely reach the other mountain. There is an element of faith that is required. 
that is required for accepting the existence of God, accepting the existence of soul, accepting that God's potency manifests as his holy name, accepting that the holy name can purify our hearts, accepting that Krishna manifests as the deity. So, so many things are there, which we can make a rational case for them. But that rational case is like building a bridge. That bridge never reaches, the bridge of rationality cannot entirely bridge the gap between, say, the empirical and the spiritual. It can go to some distance. And beyond that distance, people have to take a leap of faith. And taking that leap of faith is something which they need to be able to do. So if the distance for them is too big, and then we make them take a leap. They may not reach here, they might just fall down into the valley of faithlessness completely. So we, so to instruct a faithless person uh, uh, to in the glories of the holy name means to speak things about the holy name that the person will not be at a level to accept. That means we can't expect people to take a leap which is way beyond their capacity. So whenever we are speaking philosophy, we need to speak it in a way, okay, this is what this person knows, let's take this one step forward. That's how education happens. All education happens that way. A child who is just starting to learn math, we don't teach that child triple integral calculus at that time. If you would do that, that would be, that would be so threatening, a child may give up math study. So that is the point of that don't instruct the people, faithless people in the glories of the holy name. So how exactly we go about doing that? That will vary from person to person. So we could just speak those aspects of the philosophy which are not that unacceptable for them, which are at least intelligible for them. So that's why, again, time, place, circumstance, sensitivity is required. What can this person accept? So many people may not accept the idea of a personal God, but many people are open to the idea that you know, things happen for a purpose. There is some kind of order in the universe and things happen for a purpose. So that's what we might speak at that time. So we have to really think and uh, pray, how can I speak in a way that relates with this person, that addresses them where they are at and helps them take one step forward, at least one step forward, maybe even more. Does it answer your question? Uh, yes, Prabhuji. Very nice. The example of bridge was very, very beautiful. Like how we can make the distance short for them so that they can take a leap towards the faith. Yes. Very nice, Prabhuji. So also, can we also connect the yoga thing to the meditation or a chanting of the Hare Krishna mantra like that? If somebody is believing in the yoga or meditation and if they don't have faith in God as such, but can we also like connect it to the chanting also so that which also like helps in the, to have a peace of mind or something like that will that be a good way yes yes definitely any way we can help them to go spiritually forward that's good usually there are two we could say broadly there are two kinds of philosophy or two kinds of spiritual presentations there is a utilitarian spirituality and there is transcendental spirituality utilitarian means that how does your spirituality help me where I am right now? And transcendental spirituality is that spirituality talks about if there is another world beyond that, and that world is our ultimate destination, and that is where there's supreme relief, there is supreme joy, there's supreme love. So transcendental philosophy spirituality is not what is going to appeal to most people. Now we don't want our spiritual presentation to be only utilitarian. That means you practice spirituality and everything will be hunky-dory in this world itself. Well, no, we need to evolve in our consciousness. But as we evolve in our consciousness, we can experience a difference even in our daily lives in this world itself. So we may have to start with some utility in aspect of the spirituality. And then gradually we talk about the more transcendental aspects. So utility in aspect means that say Prabhupada would say that if people visit a temple, the temple atmosphere should be such that the decoration of the deities, the setting of the atmosphere should be such that even if people know nothing about Krishna, still they should feel some relief. They should feel, feel some charm. They should feel some peace coming to them. This atmosphere is so good. Now that atmosphere is created not just by having the deities decorated well, the temple aesthetics nice. That can be created also by the kirtan that happens over there. But the idea is 
the experience of Krishna is what should be given to them. And the temple is not, it is meant to, of course, give education about Krishna, but more important than education about Krishna is the experience of Krishna that now people may not even know I'm experiencing Krishna, but this is okay, I'm experiencing something. There's something different about this place. I suddenly feel so, I feel so calm when I come here. What is it? That's what makes them inquire. And then they can, then they can have some education about Krishna. So in that sense, whatever will help them to get some experience of Krishna where they are at, that is what we need to provide them. Okay. Any last question? Okay, there are a few comments. This is Ratsa Tarasya Hare Krishna Proji. So, just uh, to build on this, what uh, you spoke uh, in the class and the uh, last two questions. Uh, now, this is uh, really uh, very important that we should treat people personally, which is correct. And that comes with experience and the knowledge. And you are bringing very, very key point, which is important to ISKCON. But, you know, in the grassroots level or what we have learned, uh, most of the devotees, we are alienated from others. The moment we go and talk to other faith or even, you know, in Hindu, in our society also, they simply sort of their mind, you know, they're not ready to listen. So uh, how you plan to bring this, which is excellent, you know, information and very practical. How do we grow? If we practice this, obviously growth is there. And if this is known to Maharaj level and very higher level, Prabhupada and all, they know the things they love because they think everybody is Krishna's creation. So they love, treat everybody equally. Uh, but we have a tendency just to, if we hear something, we pass the judgment. We don't have time to understand and talk to other person. What is the reality? But many of the devotees, we even, we hear from somebody, we, we draw the conclusion, yes, that is correct. So I might have done, I am seeing practically that is happening. So how are you planning to pass on this message to entire community so that very grassroots level, everybody gets educated, and this is how we treat people, whether it's a Hindu, Muslim, Christian, what community. Uh, so you have to do something for this, you know, what's your message? And because it is inbuilt, we don't mix with others. Because we hear, we pass on the message. We, yes. we, yeah. we See, and generally, what has happened for us is that we grew as a very, started, our ISKCON started off as a very insular movement. And Prabhupada's first generation disciples were there. What they were practicing in bhakti was radically different from what was the mainstream culture at that time. Not just the culture of their parents, but the culture of the other hippies around them. So because of the insular, because of the culture was radically different, the focus was on more on protecting our faith, protecting our, protecting their faith. And that's why there was a, some amount of the we day mentality. We are devotees and they are non-devotees. Now, to some extent, that difference is, it's useful, but that shouldn't be the driving definition, we versus they. Ultimately, Vasudaiva uh, Kutumbakam, everybody is a we for us. Everybody is a part of Krishna's family. And there is a, in, in the early days, a devotee's primary concern might be just making sure that my faith is protected. And if other people are going to criticize, other people are going to have different beliefs. So then that might make me insecure. But as we grow, we understand that the Vedic, Vedic understanding of spirituality is very vast. And Krishna gives different people different avenues. So somebody can be worshipping Devata, somebody can be worshipping some aspect of Virat Rupa, somebody can be worshipping some other in some other religion. But Krishna gives people multiple ways to grow spiritual. And just because somebody is following other and some other path doesn't have to create insecurity in us. Krishna is working in my life in this way and Krishna is working in their life in some other way. So what, what we can do is there has to be a, as like we are having these classes. Now you are hearing some points. You will share these points. Many of these points I write in my Gita daily articles and gradually, laterally, laterally speaking, we share the message with each other. And uh, if our focus is too much on protecting our faith, which is also important, but 
if we think that if anybody else is believing or practicing something different from us is that a threat to me why should it be a threat to me they are practicing something else and they may be experiencing something and they are growing by that so krishna can manifest in many different ways to different people bhakti not thakur says that and i'll paraphrase what he is saying that if he says if i go to a different place and i a uh, place of uh, worship of some other per, some other path and i see god being worshiped there what should be my mood see that what i should think is i should be reverential thinking that god is so merciful that he is manifesting in this way to this person i don't understand the specifics of what is going on but just thinking how compassionate god is that he is manifesting in this way for this person my devotion my appreciation to god is increasing and my commitment to worshiping him with the path that i know that i am following that is increasing so for example if in an airport we see some muslims you know putting out a mat and doing namaz now or oh, we could say we could have a, we can say oh these are fanatical muslims or whatever we can we can go that way we can say that just as so they are they why are they doing this because maybe through this they are experiencing something and ultimately it is krishna they are experiencing through that so let me do my gayatri well let me do my japa well i can experience krishna this way so we don't have to be to insecure the rightness of our path does not require the wrongness of other paths that there can be different paths to krishna now we are not saying all paths are right if somebody is atheistic obviously that is that is not going to take them toward krishna so but there can be different paths it's not that all paths are right so that that uh, broadness of thought is actually a part of our tradition we just need to uh, we need to make people aware about it and one more point i would say is that in general whenever we are interacting with people look for what is similar not what is different say if we meet somebody who is uh, worshiping now right now ganesh puja is going on so uh, in india especially maharashtra and some other parts ganesh puja is very big so we might say oh this ganesh puja is just worship of devtas there's no need to do that well okay that's one way of looking at it but you now just because people are worshiping ganesh they they develop some some self sense of respect for the deities deity form they develop some respect for broad they are exhibiting some respect for vedic culture and we could appreciate that we can say ganesh is the person who spoke the mahabharat there and he spoken the bhagavad gita so instead of focusing on what is different what is the difference between us and them focus on what is similar so sometimes we might just focus too much on the specifics of the worship and say this is different but we can focus on the principle that they are worshiping and see that that is similar so like i talked about people being multi dimensional beings there is a cultural side so their cultural similarity can be more important than their specific the devotional dissimilarity so if we start for looking for what is similar then we can actually work with people rather than simply alien rather than alienating people okay so there were does it answer your question athyatra prabhu uh yes prabhu ji so this is a, yeah message is very clear if you want to succeed in the pro, progress that is the way it should be so second part was there prabhu ji how vigorously you will pass on this message so it reaches each and every devotees or at least those who are preaching so that you know, they can... you know we all have by krishna's grace we all have been given some circles of influence we share it in that circle of influence and gradually the message moves forward we can't really do anything beyond that in we in this con also we have a communications department and they are also trying to tell devotees about strategies by which you can build relationship with the broader community so i think as a movement the ethos is changing you no know, i was in the london temple and you know in the swami narayan had their leader i think pramukh swami who passed away so when they, now in london the devote there are a lot of swami narayan followers and the same people sometimes come to our temple go to swami narayan temple so then in the london newsletter they had published a message offering the condolences to all the followers of and admirers of swami, of pramukh swami uh, on his departure 
So now when I first read this, you know, we may say that their philosophy is different. So that I talked with one of the leaders over there and he said that, yes, our philosophy is different, but culturally, you know, he was respected as, as a saintly person. And even if an ordinary family member in somebody's family departs, we will offer them condolences. So we are not agreeing with all their philosophy. But if so, if many of our of people who read our newsletter, they are followers, then that's then they went. Then there was a condolence ceremony or like a memorial ceremony. They went over there. Now they did not appreciate his philosophy, but they could appreciate him as a human being. So I think overall the ethos in Iskon is changing. In some places it is happening faster, some places it's happening slower. But it is happening. And we can play our part in pushing it in, uh, in accelerating that change with whatever influence we have. So uh, thank you, Prabhuji. And uh, one last request is, uh, anyway, I'll talk to you personally. Some devotees, the, those who could not join, they have requested for recording. So hey, yes. yeah. Thank you. So just, thank you, bro. Hare Krishna. There are just some questions privately have come. So this, does this apply for only impersonalists or for everyone? Uh, yes, it applies for and everyone. We need to be personal in our dealings with devotees as well as non-devotees and everyone. Mm. Like sometimes I feel the word non-devotees itself is a judgmental word. Because from the philosophical perspective, everybody is a devotee. We could use the word non-practitioners rather than non-devotees. They're just not practicing their devotion right now. Now, in general, there's one question that the two parts of the question. One is that we don't do mundane charity because that might distract our movement from sharing Krishna, from sharing Harinam and Krishna's direct glories. But then, in the name of being faithful, we might speak philosophy without considering the circumstance. So, how do we avoid both these extremes? See, with respect to charitable work, charity is, is good. It is noble. Much of our tradition has focused on, this is, say, this is ignorant, tamoguna, rajoguna, sattva guna, and there is shuddha sattva. There is goodness and there is pure goodness. So much of our tradition has focused on the contrast between goodness and pure goodness. That means, that say for example Parikshit Maharaj or Arjuna they were already evolved people they were already situated in goodness and the Bhagavad Gita's message was to take Arjuna from goodness to pure goodness Parikshit Maharaj was already a responsible dharmic king and, and uh, responsible of Shukdev Goswami was to take him to pure goodness where he's absorbed in nothing except Krishna so to highlight how pure goodness is higher than goodness Sometimes we may minimize, sometimes we may, we may find faults with goodness. But still goodness is much, much better than passion or ignorance. Sattva guna is far better than Rajaguna and Tamaguna. So charity, charitable works when people are hungry or people are in a natural calamity, that is good, noble work. That is in the mode of goodness. Now as contrasted with pure goodness, that is not what we want uh, to be doing instead of the activity of pure goodness. But just because it is not as good as pure goodness doesn't mean it is bad. It is good. It is good and we are not condemning it per se. We are condemning it as a substitute for activities of pure goodness. So as a movement, our primary thrust is going to be, uh, going to be the sharing of Krishna Bhakti. At the same time, if devotees as individuals or devotees come together and they want to do some, uh, some charitable activity, it's not that it is to be banned. It is something which that will not be our individual or our organization's primary focus because there are many other organizations doing charitable activity. How many are actually sharing Krishna's Bhakti, Krishna, Krishna Bhakti directly? So we have a particular thrust, but that doesn't mean what is not our thrust is bad. It is just that our primary resources shouldn't go in that direction. Uh, but we may branch into various different activities at different times in terms of individual devotees with inspiration doing various things. And Prabhupada himself had the Food for Life program also, which he inspired. So 
charitable activity can be done now the challenge is that we might drift away from hari now well that's possible but we can drift away in many ways so i would say we can we can drift away by going into sensuality we can grow drift away by going into so many other things so drifting away is always a danger and we have to be cautious about it so we would put it this way that those who are directly doing krishna conscious activities and are satisfied in doing krishna conscious activities they don't have to think that oh i have to do something for society and so i have to get into social service uh but if somebody already had that zeal from before and they came to krishna bhakti and they were told that social service is all mundane just do krishna bhakti and they do krishna bhakti but then they they still have that longing to do social service well then they could do that and they could make their social service as a bridge by which they can gradually bring people to krishna now we do that in so many ways say for example somebody wants to really become a great mu- great singer or a great musician they may go and study music and when they study the technicalities of music or singing they not really thinking about krishna somebody might go into scientific outreach there are devotees who go into academia and then they study so much academic stuff which is not directly devotional some of it is contrary to devotion also so if that is their inspiration we can't ban it but what we want to make sure is that doesn't become our in our primary focus as uh, as a movement and regarding that how do i outgrow that mentality of just speaking one thing well that is largely by associating with devotees who are mature i think uh, vishakha mata ji or you are jamuna mata ji i think vishakha mata ji only she tells that she was with prabhupada in india and they had gone to uh, uh, some well wishers house for for prasad and a devotee told them that the the devotee saw that there was some onion in that food and he told prabhupada there is onion and prabhupada said there is no onion he said no prabhupada there is onion over here prabhupada said there is no onion in this and then he actually took out a piece of onion and showed it to prabhupada this is onion prabhupada looked at him. prabhupada didn't even look at him prabhupada said there is no onion in this and prabhupada was so grave that the devotee just became silent by that and they all took that food and when they were coming back when they came back the devotees all had a big question and prabhupada said it was our mistake that we didn't tell them in advance that we don't take food with onion garlic and he said for an for an indian family to have a sadhu come to their house to take food is a is a great great honor for them and the worst disaster for them is a sadhu gets angry with them and gives up their food without eating food goes away from them so now i'm not saying that we should start eating onion garlic food the point i'm making is so what vishakha mata ji says in that she said after that incident i realized that being krishna, becoming krishna conscious is an adventure it is not simply ticking a set of bullet points it is an adventure that how can i be krishna conscious in this situation how can i be krishna conscious in that situation it is we have to consider we have to pray and then dadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upayanti te krishna will give us the intelligence of how we can be conscious of krishna and how we can act in a way that we can help raise others towards krishna consciousness okay so thank you very much hare krishna thank you so much chetan chand prabhu ji hare wonderful hare. class and uh, prabhu ji is 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 time up or do we have a few more minutes prabhu for you you have as many minutes as you want krishna krishna thank you prabhu ji prabhu ji first of all amazing class prabhu ji such an eye opener thank you thank you so much uh, especially in the times when um, institutional burden uh, is making several leaders go impersonal in their perspective the class was uh, very very timely thank you so much prabhu ji um so probably one comment and uh, maybe two side questions um the comment was uh, about how uh, krishna responded to uh, arjuna in abhimanyu situation uh, very similarly krishna responds to draupadi uh, in the in the forest right after uh, um, she is humiliated and they are in the forest krishna meets them and uh, draupadi asks uh, 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 krishna why did you not uh, come and help me 
and uh, Krishna doesn't give an impersonal answer and doesn't speak philosophy there, but he, he gives a very, very personal response. If you have any comments uh, or points to add in that context, I, I want to hear from you, Prabhuji. That's the first one. Uh, the, the second and third, there are sub-questions, but I can wait. So Okay, it's a big thing. But yes, that's also a good example. Krishna doesn't uh, doesn't uh, condemn Draupadi for saying that why are you challenge why don't you have faith in my plan my plan is perfect he doesn't go in that direction at all he focuses on that she's in distress and he says that he says I was busy at another place he says there's even Shalya or Shalva had attacked Dwarka and I was busy defending as soon as I came to know what had happened I came to you <coughs> So sometimes when people are facing distress, as preachers, sometimes our focus is more on getting God off the hook rather than helping that person. That God is not to be blamed for this. Don't blame God or it is your own karma because of your suffering. Well, that should not be our thrust. Our thrust has to be on how can I help this person? So even Krishna doesn't try to uh, say, don't blame me. Krishna says, I, I came as soon as I could. <coughs> mm. So there is a difference between say protecting a person, protecting say our image of Krishna or our conception of what will be people's faith in Krishna Yeah. Rather than that, instead of that, we can focus more on how best can I uh, help this person in this situation. And if if the Krishna conscious philosophy, if the Krishna conscious practice is also one part of it, that's that's fine. I can do that also. <coughs> so that's a big incident, and um, I think I won't go more into that. But what was the other part? So the, the two other, Prabhuji, you gave us three-minute exercise and uh, there was two things I was thinking. Uh, one was uh, um, uh, His Holiness Bhakti Char Maharaj uh, passed away recently and uh, some of the disciples of Bhakti Char Maharaj in our, are in our Bhakti Vriksha. And uh, when they approached uh, me, uh, what would have been my response? So um, I want to hear from you. How you would have <laughs> responded? That's the that's the first uh, uh, question. There's one more question. That's it. Well, I answered this question on my website. I can send you a link, but I'll okay, it quickly, briefly. See, um, every action between a devotee and Krishna has multiple levels to it. When a devotee feels inspired to serve Krishna, we accept that, we, we, we not only accept, but we, uh, we take that as an inspiration. So consider two examples. Say, Jatayu, when he tried to stop Sita, stop Sita from being abducted. Now at one level, that's glorious. Jatayu was ready to lay down his life for the service of Lord Ram. Mm. Now we could argue why didn't Lord Ram protect Jatayu? Well, Lord Ram did protect Jatayu in the sense that Lord Ram personally arranged to do his last rites and everything. Uh, and uh, at the same time, the scriptures are not uh, are not uh, always pro showing that those who are devoted will always be victorious at the material level. So the material so. The spiritual success of Jatayu is that you know he laid his life down for the service of the Lord, and that's glorious. At the same time, the material odds were against him, and we don't see or we don't demand or expect that the material odds uh, should be changed by Krishna. He can do it at times, but so Jatayu's death is glorious. Because he laid down his life for the service of the Lord. And if a devotee, now Sita herself had told Jatayu, 
Now don't try to fight Ravana. Just inform Ram. But that's what Jatayu felt inspired to do at that time. And I have not seen ever any any Acharya you know, Jatayu shouldn't have done this. No, it is glorious. At the same time, the material lords played their role. So a spiritual intention is itself glorious, and spiritual intention in the presence of material danger. It actually points to the depth of points to the depth of the devotion. At the same time, whether just the spiritual intention will always guarantee material protection. You know, that is not necessarily so. Let's take another example of uh, Abhimanyu. Abhimanyu was sent by Yudhishthir to break the chakra view. And he knew how to enter, but he didn't know how to come out. And he perished inside. Now the next day, Arjuna took a vow that I will bring down Jayadev. Then Arjuna entered into the Kaurava army. And he went deep inside. And after that, Yudhishthir started becoming apprehensive. Yesterday, Abhimanyu was trapped inside. What if Arjuna is trapped today? And then he told Satyaki to go inside. And then Satyaki broke his way inside and followed the trail that Arjuna had created. And then Yudhishthir became apprehensive that actually, Satyaki is young like Abhimanyu, not so young, but still is young. What if he gets trapped? And then he sent Bhima inside. And then Bhima, Satyaki and Arjuna worked together and Arjuna was able to bring down Jayadrath. So uh, now at one level, you could say Yudhishthir, was it a mistake on Yudhishthir's part that he sent Abhimanyu inside? Well, Yudhishthir, then there's a I gave a whole class on this topic of uh, on on anyway that's a different topic. There's a difference between responsible taking responsibility, uh, being taking responsibility and being culpable. So nobody considered Yudhishthir to be culpable at that time. Culpable means criminally wrong. So Yudhishthir was not criminally wrong. That it is a battle and that seemed to be the soundest strategy at that time. So he took that strategy. And somehow it backfired. But that doesn't mean if a strategy hasn't worked, we don't make it into a principle and still we are going to do it again. So in that case, in the next day, he tried to have some protective measures to prevent the repetition of that. So when a devotee has a spiritual intention and does some action, we see that spiritual intention as glorious, independent of the material result of that action. And we appreciate the, the courage and the vigor that goes into that spiritual intention. At the same time, we don't have to standardize or normalize that action based on the spiritual intention. So if we understand that a particular action leads to some unforeseen consequences or some untoward consequences, then just like Yudhishthir adopted the next day's strategy and he sent some backup help. So we also need to take some backup help. We also need to make some alternative plans. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Prabhu. Very, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Shila Prabhupada ki jai. Thank you. Daura ki jai. Shri Chaitanya Charan Prabhuji ki jai. Thank you, Prabhuji, for your time. Prabhupada ki jai. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.